it's it's weird because you never really consciously put yourself well I don't consciously put my realize what I'm doing when I'm doing it uh, so my only kind of idea that it was really different to anything that I'd ever done was when I first read the script and thought that I couldn't do it because it was too <laughs> different um, and I kind of realized after it's that sort of stuck with me afterwards thinking well that's kind of that should be the way to choose projects I guess or go after which projects to go after the ones you don't understand the ones you're scared of um, because it generally means, I mean, you know, you'll probably end up being better afterwards, uh, or at least do something which every single person asks. Like, so this is a big departure for you, <laughs> like, I mean, like, so, and it's kind of great. I mean, that's like, you know, it's not saying it's it's so much better than I did this movie called Remember Me, where every single, which I really like, but every single journalist was asking me, so is this the closest to your real self? Like, it's like, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's just, but because he was a student, and because and I did kind of relate to it, like, on a, quite a, just, human level. Like, not really as an actor or anything. I mean, I just thought it was interesting. Um, but yeah, this is, I, but once I started doing it, I didn't feel like it was a big, you know, I wasn't conscious of it being a departure. I, just, I knew I always liked it. And connected to. I thought it was interesting uh, that you mentioned that because yesterday at the press conference, and I think in Cannes as well, you were asked what you called the flawed question about you know, comparing Eric Packer to your real life, to the isolation of you know, and and I thought the answer was really great that you guys gave in the sense that you know, uh, sometimes I think people have a problem disconnecting uh, the actor's craft, what the actor does from the from their real life. And, you know, someone who is as well-known as you, do you, I mean, obviously you find this a little bit. People ask you those kind of questions over and over again, do they? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, people are fascinated by fame, which mm. is weird. I think it's because, like, in America, because there's no, uh, it's like the, the monarchy of a meritocracy. It's like the thing which you can, uh, it's achievable for everybody. It's that, it's like, I guess being famous is an embodiment of American dream now because you can be an idiot. <laughs> you can be a totally unqualified idiot and still get paid low, disproportionate amounts of money for doing seemingly nothing. And I guess that's what everybody's dream is now. I saw some poll the other day saying that, uh, about they were asking 15 year old kids if you, what would you like to be the most? Like a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, a, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, or an assist, personal assistant to a celebrity. And like 75% of people said personal assistant to a celebrity. It's like, you do realize that the Fortune 500 company, you could marry like eight of them. <laughs> like, I mean, like, but, uh, and be a Nobel Peace Prize winner potentially. But um, yeah, it's so strange, this thing with fame. People, it's like, it's so, it's, it's boring. Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's almost, you know, it's, on one level, you'd say, well, it's because, you know, I'd like to say, it's because people don't really understand the creative process, really. And they particularly, they certainly don't understand the creative process for a director. But they also don't really, although they delude themselves into thinking they can, they don't really understand how the creative process works for an actor. And, uh, and, and this is... This is giving them the benefit of the doubt and not thinking about celebrity, but basically it's like, uh, do they have some glimmerings of the, you know, the, the Stanislavski process that, that, that you use stuff from your own life in order to create a character or not? Maybe, but I, that's giving a lot of credit to, you know, the popular imagination. But on that level, you could say, well, that's interesting. They wonder how much of your own life do you need to bring to a role when it's a character who's totally not like you? You know, how much can there, there's something? Uh, so it's actually an interesting question, or it could be, right. but probably in this case, it's not. <laughs> and right. act, actors, I mean? actors also like to delude themselves, but they can actually be something which is completely not themselves. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're just, I guess I brought nothing of my real life into it. It's completely my own yeah, construction. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. Could you um, put this in the, in the context of? Uh, I understand this movie was actually shot before Occupy Wall Street became a became a force. Well, to be during right. actually, during. during. Yeah, yeah, that was sort of happening while we were shooting, and and also the Rupert Murdoch pie in the face. 
I wish I mentioned Paul Giamatti texted me at one point. He said, I can't believe this. Rupert Murdoch just got a pie in the face. Because we just shot the scene with, with Rob's character getting a pie in the face. Uh, also by a pastry assassin who was <laughs> protesting, you know, abuse of, of uh, the power of capitalists and, and all of that. So, uh, but it, it, it isn't why we made the movie. <coughs> because I, the movie was, the book was written about 12 years ago. And, uh, and Don has talked about how it started for him, and it was really just meditations on the limos in New York, saying, you know, these long, clumsy limos in these tight streets of Manhattan, you know, who's in them, and why do they do that, and why do they need a limo? Which is gone now, as well. You don't, I mean, I don't think that's a big, a very prevalent thing in New York. Anymore. Really? I didn't even know that. And, yeah. and, and, like, where do they go at night? All these sort of kind of pragmatic questions that then lead you into some metaphysics and stuff. He wasn't really thinking about the the eurozone, you know, right. when he was doing that, and it led him into an interesting world of of guys who might he could have just as easily figured it being some other kind of celebrity or rock star or hip hop artist or something like that, but he chose uh, a Wall Street tycoon, and that just led him to that. So it wasn't like I will do a book about what I see as the coming economic crisis. He didn't. It's not the way it works at all. And for us, the same. You know, it was just intriguing for me. I started working on this about three and a half years ago, and I actually wrote the script before I shot Andrew's Method. So it's as though the world has caught up with the book, and it might bring more people into the theater, or at least it gives some people interest, interesting things to write about, but it's not really of the essence of you know, why we made the, the movie. We would have made it anyway, even if the world was in a great economic shape, you know. Um, because the stuff that's interesting about it is character stuff and the idea of a character who lives in such an abstraction, he's abstracted himself so, so extremely in his life that he barely knows how to talk to his wife or, you know, order dinner or anything like that. So all of that's interesting whether, there, whether the Eurozone was in crisis or not. Because when you think of it, uh, there is no economic crisis in the movie. I mean, it's his, it's Eric Packer's crisis, which he's brought on himself. So it's an individual, you know, billionaire's problem, um, perhaps suicidal and in, in intent, but it's not really de dealing with the world economic crisis. Well, there is the riot going on. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, there have been protests, you know, there, there are students protesting about money in Montreal right now, you know, so it's not really, that's, and in fact, when you think of it, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement is is not anti-capitalist. They aren't communists. They want. They just want to be part of the one percent. You know, they want more of the capitalist dream. So it's not as though they're anti-capitalist protesters. You know what I mean? And and I don't think they represent what's happening with the eurozone at all. I don't think they're thinking of that at all. They're thinking about Bernie Madoff and they're thinking about CEOs that get forty million dollar parachute, golden parachute packages when they've destroyed a, a company and, and they're rewarded for it, you know, and that outrages them, and, uh, and we, we all can understand that. But that's not the same as, God, the Eurozone is maybe falling apart, it's not the same thing. I wanted to, uh, since I've seen the movie, uh, every day I, I, I have a different idea of what it's about. <laughs> I've been thinking about it a great deal. And I think we were like that too. Well, I, you know, yesterday I was thinking, well, you know, this is a, Eric Packer is a, a character, a, a guy who has done everything. At a young age, he has everything at his disposal, no matter what he wants, uh, he can it, it, on some level have, and death is the last kind of exciting thing for him. Uh, today, I think it's more about money as an abstract idea because Eric probably has never actually spent that much money. He's never probably touched all that much real money. He just moves it around and creates creates more wealth without ever actually seeing it. So does money money. So that's what I think. And I've seen the finished product. I've seen the movie that 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 uh, uh, that you wanted me to see. In the early stages of this, the script, uh, I understand, didn't change. But if I find it this confusing, how, not confusing, but thought-provoking, how do you as an actor uh, get a grip on a character who um, uh, who has so many facets, and there, there there was so much to say about him. Um, like uh, you don't approach it in in a in a way uh, in the normal way of uh, you would approach a character. I mean, I guess I I think I 
think that was one of the things I've come away from this movie with. I mean, just in terms of acting in general, um, you don't need to analyze things that much. You don't need to understand it. I mean, I like the poetry of the script when I first read it, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of the time, um, like my the friend of mine is a writer called Jez Butterworth. He wrote this play called Jerusalem, uh, and he. He was, there's an actor called Mark Rylance who is amazing and um, he was telling me that he wrote this, he wrote a version of Jerusalem and gave it to I mean Mark said he'd do it and he, and he was around at his house and he started <coughs> reciting um, I can't remember what poet it was well, it might have been Shakespeare I think um, and just the sound of his voice and stuff in front of Jez and how he was reading something completely changed Jez's idea of it and he, complete, he rewrote Jerusalem and five days or something and then it was like the best play I mean he wrote it purely for the sound of Mark's voice like he said an idea of how he wanted to hear it um, and I think you know that's nothing to do with a psychoanalysis it's literally just it's just uh, uh, sensuous uh, you know, it's sensory I mean it's kind of and, and that's, I mean, that was one of the things I liked. I liked saying it. I still like saying it. Whenever I see clips of it, I want to say the lines again. It's just a pure, it's like eating. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I think I would love it if you could approach everything like that afterwards. But I think, you know, if there are certain conventional ways you have to do things in most movies. I mean, there are beats you have to hit. And in this, there are no beats I had to hit, I don't think. Never felt like I needed to. I'm not very good at hitting beats. <laughs> <laughs>